Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be with all of you today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A few things before we get into our worship service today. A couple announcements just at the beginning here. First off, on Tuesday at noon, we have our wonderful Silver Sage group meeting uh, for another great meal and time of fellowship. So uh, please join us if you are one of, one of those wonderful Silver Sagers. Um, I will also be there. I don't have enough white hair, but you're kind enough to let me be there. Thank you. Also, we have our ladies' spring brunch. It's just around the corner, okay, with May 4th from 10 a.m. to noon. So all you ladies, please join us for the brunch and invite your friends. It's, it's, uh, it's a good time. It's free of charge. You do need to bring a little dish. Don't worry. I believe in you. We have our VBS also coming up. It's crazy. It's only a couple months away, which doesn't feel real. But we've got VBS, and uh, we need volunteers. We currently have, I think, around 25. We usually aim for 100. So if you are interested in volunteering, please sign up. There's information in the bulletin about how to do that. Uh, and also, if you have a kid or grandkid who would like to come to VBS, make sure to get them signed up so we can start organizing all the classrooms and getting everything in place. Um, but it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, and it will be Matt's first VBS, so that will be a good time, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, just an FYI. Well, that is all for our announcements, so if you would please stand. Uh, we are going to not do the Apostles' Creed, because we'll do it when we welcome our new members, but we have a wonderful reading, which An Andy? Andy will do. Thank you, Andy. You're welcome. This is from Ephesians chapter 5. Speak to each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your hearts to the Lord. Always give thanks to God, the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's make some music. Yeah, it says in Scripture that if we don't sing, even the rocks will cry out, but I know that God would love to hear your voices, so let's raise our voices to him. One, two, three, four. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you. The mountains, they bow down before you. So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you. Your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you. The mountains they bow down before you. So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you. Join with the earth and I'll sing my praise. 
It's so great to have all, all of you kids here today. Is everybody signed up for Vacation Bible School yet? 
oh, talk to your parents. We're going to have a ton of fun. And if you're kindergarten, you'll get me as your teacher. So isn't that exciting? <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about Paul's letter to the Colossians. Now, do you guys know anything about Paul? Do you know anything about him? What do you know? He was a traveler. He was an apostle who knew Jesus really well. He, he was an apostle. Um, he came a little later than the disciples, but I always think of him kind of as a disciple too. So Paul knew a lot about Jesus. He'd been serving him for many years. And he went to Colossae, which is in the country of Turkey. Isn't that kind of a funny name for a country? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But anyway. <laughs> um, now, there were some people in this church that were teaching false things, things that weren't true. They were saying that there was extra wisdom and knowledge that you needed to know and that you needed to do extra things to be disciples of Jesus or followers of Jesus. And so he, went, he sent this letter to say, you really don't need special wisdom and you don't need all of these extras um, because Paul knew that there was no extra or special wisdom outside of Jesus. Um, you know, they wanted the, them to do extra things like stand on their head and rub their belly three times. Have you guys ever done that? Have, yeah, I wouldn't do it and try and rub your belly because you might fall over. But anyway, just things that were extra, things that didn't need to be done. So... Paul knew that since Christ created all people and all things, there was no one more wise than Christ. Uh, he's the wisest, most knowledgeable on everything. So if you know someone smart or someone wise, Christ is smarter. He's wiser because he made those wise people. He made those smart people, right? Okay, so be careful anytime you hear someone say there is something outside of Christ that you need or that you have to stand on your head and rub your belly three times to believe in Christ. <laughs> Christ is all you need. And did you know when you ask Christ into your heart, do you know what happens? Can anybody tell me what happens? Evelyn? Yeah, you become a follower of his. And, yeah. He takes away your sin. Anybody know anything else? Evelyn? Well, he, he loves you very much, but he lives inside you. Did you know that? Like everywhere you go, if you ask Christ into your heart, he's with you. He's inside you. That's kind of crazy, huh? Pretty wonderful. Uh, sometimes I forget that and feel weak and lonely and scared. But then I remember, I am not alone. I have this power of Christ in me. That's huge. So let's ask God to remind us that we don't need any extras outside of Christ. We just need to remember that he is not only the best of everything, but that he lives in us. <laughs> wow, we've got a great God. Now, before we pray, let me remind you that we do not have Sunday school today, so you guys need to go back and sit with your parents or grandparents, whoever you came with, um, after we pray. So, let's pray. Dear Jesus, please remind us each and every day that you are in us. Because of that, we can call on you anytime to give us all the wisdom we need, all the strength we need, 
all the love we need to do what is right and good. Thank you for being all we need. We love and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, now we have a special time where we are going to be welcoming some new members into our church. So if you took the new member class or we have one person who did a personal interview with me, could you please come forward? I see you out there. Don't be afraid. I won't name who it was, but one of the members in the class last week was like, do we, do we have to come up there? <laughs> Which, you know, I don't blame them. How many of you have stage fright? Yeah, good. Yep, quite a few of you. So that is completely fair. Here, take one, pass it down. Here, take one and pass it down. All right. Well, today we are welcoming into our Christ Lutheran Church family. At this service, we have the Comstocks, we have Heidi England, Lois Smith, the Gemmels, we have, of course, the Schnells, which is a fun name, and we have Erica Ruda. Who are you? Have you been in this church a while? I'm just kidding. Erica's here, Lori Brainerd, and then, of course, the Davidsons. Um, so yeah, very excited to have them be joining the church as members today. Um, yeah, well, good job, good job, good job. So part of the final step of membership in the church uh, is to affirm some key confessions, which I'm going to ask uh, them now, but uh, I also want you as a congregation to partake in this part of the service, so please respond uh, along with our new members. So the first question, do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and his empty promises? I do, and I ask God to help. Good job. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in the Comstocks, Heidi England, Lois Smith, the Gemmels, the Schnells, Erica Ruda, Lori Brainerd, and the Davidsons, the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm their faith, guide their lives, empower them in their serving, and give them patience and suffering, and bring them to everlasting life. Amen. So let us all now stand and welcome our new members into Christ Lutheran Church. All right, greet one another. Good job.
States. So as many of you maybe uh, saw, we sent an email out from Shepherd's Hand uh, about a week or so ago, and Shepherd's Hand is transitioning in their mission uh, that they have been doing here at the church for 28 years, I believe, um, from the medical side of things to, uh, I don't want to, I shouldn't steal everything you're going to say, Jennifer, but (laughs) um, to a lot of in-home care, um, and it's it's a really exciting time talking to Jennifer. You can just hear the passion and excitement. Um, it's a big change for us, having partnered with them directly for 28 years. Um, but Jennifer has uh, agreed to come and just share with you uh, what's going on in the transition, and then, of course, just thanking the church for many years of partnership. So welcome, Jennifer Hyatt. Thank you. <laughs> So good morning, you guys. It's another absolutely beautiful day. And spring is a season of new beginnings, and such is the case for Shepherd's Hand. Um, You've now heard (laughs) that we're in the process of winding down our free clinic services um, so that we can put our full energy into this new volunteer caregiving program. Um, It's a decision that we did not take lightly. There is a lot of discussion, a lot of prayer, a lot of thought went into this. But the time's right for us now to, for, to forge um, a new version of Shepherd's Hand. Um, it's our intention for this next chapter to build on the foundation that has been laid, one of volunteerism, community, and faith. Um, Christ Lutheran Church has walked alongside us since the inception of Shepherd's Hand 28 years ago. You've supported us in numerous ways, and I see many folks <laughs> before me now who've been instrumental in the success of our free clinic. Thank you. Thank you for providing us a home. Thank you for your financial support. Thank you for your prayers. We are truly excited for what lies ahead for Shepherd's Hand. And although we may have less of a physical footprint here at Christ Lutheran Church, it's our intent to stay connected. Um, I do have um, some cards out front that have some of our contact information that you can feel free to grab. If you have any questions or want to have more conversation about our decision, how we got there, or about our new program, certainly I'm available. Please feel free to reach out anytime. And in the meantime, we have a video that I want to share that kind of highlights our volunteer caregiving program um, so that you can kind of see more about what we're up to in our next chapter here. Thanks. The volunteer... Go for the video. Yeah, yeah. The volunteer caregiving program at Shepherd's Hand mainly helps homebound seniors. We're non-medical volunteers that can help people with light housekeeping duties. We can transport people for essential needs to medical appointments, or we can also do grocery runs and pickups for essential needs, even medications for pharmacies, and then drop it off at their home and take in the groceries for them. We go into people's homes and and meet with them and spend some time with them. We do uh, chores around the house if that's what they need. We uh, provide them some conversation and companionship. It's just a great program out there that helps the community and um, the people in need. The main need is companionship and conversation. I mean, if we just went and talked to them for the hour or hour and a half we were there, that would be enough for them. I volunteer every other week um, and visit a couple that are quite spry and quite fun to be with. They just had simply asked for someone to help them mop their linoleum. And that's how it all started. 
How long did we live in Kalispell? Be eight years in May. Eight years in May. Okay. Yeah, and we have a wonderful housekeeper <laughs> that comes in. She's more than a housekeeper. She's she's actually been a friend. And I can't hardly walk, and I can't stand up very long. So uh, everything she does here is a a blessing for me. I I couldn't tell you how much I appreciate it, because I know I couldn't do it all by myself. And there's a times when I probably would have ended up in some home or something if somebody didn't come in and do some of this for me. We really appreciate what we, because we didn't have anybody here to talk to, you know, and, uh, but now we do have some friends and uh, so uh, we're very fortunate. This organization has that uh, ability of connecting uh, neighbors with neighbors where normally I wouldn't know that there is somebody in need, uh, but uh, the staff does, and it's just been a great opportunity to uh, shine some sunshine into somebody else's life and brighten their day. Unfortunately, it's too easy for individuals just to be isolated the older they get and uh, less friends or contacts that they have. And so to me, it's a real joy, and I, I just really, uh, uh, enjoy connecting with people and helping them in, in the little way that I can. Although our focus is on helping these folks, um, every time when we leave, we just feel better about ourselves and, and about the community. One of the aspects I really appreciate with volunteering here at Shepherd's Hand is that you can put as little or as time you can put into it or as much as you want. This program is really very flexible as far as your time commitment. We also have, I'm going to call them mentors, other volunteers that are willing to go on those first few visits with you, or you can be a team member and help support clients together with some of our other volunteers. I have thoroughly enjoyed being part of Shepherd's Hand, and I would wholeheartedly recommend anyone who's just a little bit curious or interested in what this program is to reach out to Sandy. To get started at Shepherd's Hand in the volunteer caregiving program, the first thing we just need an application filled out. Right now I'm your connection at sandy at shepherdshand.com or at our website, there is a little bit of information, www.shepherdshand.com, and we can get you started. If you're considering this caregiving program, um, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's heartwarming, it's flexible on your own time, and um, there's a lot of lonely people and the need is out there, so please volunteer. And we are going to pray for Shepherd's Hand um, now. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for the many, many, many years that you have used Shepherd's Hand Clinic to serve those who are under-resourced in this community. Um, we're thankful that they have been a light for so many, um, providing essential services um, that really all of us in our society need. Um, Lord, we know that things change, that there are new seasons, and we pray in this new season for Shepherd's Hand that you would bless them mightily in everything that they do, um, that you would call forth the volunteers to help care for so many in our community who are shut in or who are uh, dealing with mobility issues, um, that you would bring joyful and cheerful people to, to love those in need and to share your good news with them uh, through word and through deed. Uh, we pray for Jen Jennifer as the director of Shepherd's Hand and all these big changes. I know it's a lot. Um, pray that you would give her the strength and the peace and the endurance uh, during this time of transition. And again, we thank you for the many years we've had together here directly in the church, and we know that we will continue to work together for your kingdom moving forward in this new way.
We give you all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. Our reading today is from Psalm 29. This is a Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. He thunders over the waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forests bare. And in, the, in his temple, all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Thank you. So we are in a series in the book of Colossians. And we took a, wait, a break last week to allow Cade to share his experience on his YWAM mission. And that was a fantastic, um, fantastic time together. So, so thank you, Cade, for doing that. And um, it's good to be here this morning. And as I'm looking out, I'm uh, seeing so many people I've gotten to know and who have welcomed me into this church and some faces I don't know. And so if you don't know me, if I haven't actually been introduced to you, my name is Matt Davis, and I'm the new associate pastor and family and youth minister here at Christ Lutheran. And so I'm excited to be here, and um, I'm excited to dive into God's Word with you this morning. So if you would, open your Bibles with me, and we are going to read out of Colossians 1, verses 24 through 2, verse 5. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. For the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known among the Gentiles how great are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And for this reason I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for those who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith. Christ. Please pray with me. Father God, we are so grateful 
to be in your presence this morning. We're so grateful to be here together and to worship you and to give you our praise and honor. Lord, would you be glorified in what we're doing? Would you, we lift up your word and in doing so praise your name? And would you prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning? That it would change our lives and that we would be able to live in a close relationship with you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So one of the things that's been really exciting about moving here is, is getting to experience so many new things, from the newness of, of snow to the newness of um, the mountains and the trees and snowmobiles and just everything. I have loved getting to be here. And, and these last couple days, the weather outside has been amazing. And so that's just filled me with a lot of excitement as we look forward to the summer. And not just, though, because um, I'll get to explore, and hopefully together we'll get to explore the mountains and the trails and the lakes and the streams and the rivers, but, um, but also, and this is just a personal thing, I'm really excited because later this summer, for two weeks, the eyes of the world will fall on Paris as athletes from over 200 nations will gather to compete in the Summer Olympic Games. And I am excited about this. I love the Olympics. Whatever sport it is, if it's an Olympic sport, I am honed in, whether it's handball, to women's gymnastics and synchronized swimming, to regular swimming and track and field. I, I, just, I just love, I love it. It's because we get to see and experience, even secondhand, the old adage that says, like, as the athletes compete for, um, for, the, for the glory of victory, or face the agony of defeat. And so as I've thought about that, I've thought about that word glory. What is glory? What does it mean? We use it a lot, but if we're not careful, it can become one of those churchy words that we use so much, we have actually no understanding of what it actually entails. And so to kind of figure it out, because we talk about it in our culture, we talk about it in life, but it's also here in scripture, I looked it up in the original Greek in which Paul was writing. And it's translated doxia, and its definition is the honor, value, and exaltation given to a person because of his or her status, accomplishments, or achievements. So in other words, glory is the respect and honor we give to someone or something because of who they are or what they've done. And so when I think about this in terms of the Olympics or in sports in general, I, I can understand that a little bit better. We refer to people like Michael Jordan or Michael Phelps, Simone Biles or Tom Brady as the GOAT, the greatest of all times, because of their achievement, because they have gone beyond the limits of what we thought was possible. And they have done something remarkable. And so we give them our awe and we reward them with, like we reward their talent and their performance with respect, claim, acclaim, money, and fame. But this isn't just um, kind of focused on athletes. We give glory to people in all different realms of our life, to world leaders, to artists, to activists, to warriors, to, to speakers, to scholars. We give our glory away. And what we also do is it doesn't have to be kind of on a global scale to a celebrity. It can be to the person that we just have stood in awe of. Think about when you were in middle school, the kid who was funny or pretty or athletic, who seemed to just exist in a, in a spotlight of sorts, who seemed to have some sort of gravitational pull on others. That is glory. And we wanted to be near it. And we wanted to have it for ourselves. And so in scriptures, though, we find that ultimate glory belongs to God. In this late reading we just heard this morning from Psalm 29, what we saw and what we heard begins with, Ascribe to the Lord, O heavens. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength that is due his name. It is God himself who is worthy of our glory. And he is worthy of our respect, our honor, and praise because of who he is and what he's done. But interestingly, the word glory that appears in the Old Testament is not the same as the word glory that appears in the New. And that's because they were written 
like hundreds and thousands of years apart in different languages. In the Old Testament, that word is kavod. It's kavod. And it's one of the most fascinating words, I think, in Scripture because it's used to describe some things that are really remarkable scenes. And so, yes, in, it entails the respect and honor and acclaim that we hear in the New Testament, but it's that and much more. And so one of the first times we see it appear in Scripture is in Exodus 19, when Moses and the people of Israel are gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai, and God is about to meet with them. And I want to read to you some of that passage. It says, On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, and a thick cloud was on the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in a smoke, because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. At the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. And then the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of all the people of Israel. The glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire. Interestingly, this notion appears a couple more times. First, when God's glory falls on the tabernacle, and then later, when his glory falls on the, t- uh, on the temple itself. But then, centuries later, the priest Ezekiel has a vision of God, where this word glory comes up again. And I want to read that to you. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was among the exiles by the Chaber Canal, and the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. And above the expanse, over the heads of the creatures, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of the throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire, enclosed it all around. And downward, from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the clouds on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. And such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. Here, what we see is the kavod of God. And yes, it entails respect, esteem, and value. But there's more. Literally, it is translated as weight or heaviness. It's depicted in Scripture as light, but more than light, as radiance or brilliance, but a radiance and brilliance and light that has substance. It's felt in addition to being seen. It has mass. It has matter. And so one theologian I was reading this week as I was preparing and studying about this described the kavod of God as the manifestation of the sum total of his eternal attributes perfectly and intrinsically within him. That the glory of God is who God is. All of his character, all of his attributes, all of these things together. And it has a substance, a mass, a splendor, a radiance. And God's glory does not depend on anything or anyone outside of himself. And it never ceases. And so this brings us back to Colossians. And as we come here and think about the glory that Paul is writing about, we have to remember that first and foremost, Paul was a Jew. That although he spoke Greek fluently, and although he had lived in a Greek culture, Hebrew And the Jewish culture was the subsect that he was raised in. And even more, he was trained and educated as a Pharisee. And so his understanding of glory 
was that Old Testament understanding of, Gav of Kavad. And it was etched in his mind and, his, and, the, and shaped what he was writing about when he was writing to the Colossians. And so two weeks ago, when Pastor Dylan was talking and preaching on the first passage of Colossians, and it was about the preeminence of Christ, that he is the image of the unseen God, the firstborn over all creation, and for him and by him all things were made that were made. Whether rulers, powers, thrones, or authorities, all things are his. And so that's what it's talking about, that Christ, in Christ, is the full manifestation of God's glory, of the kavod of God. And it says that in him, uh, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That in Christ, God's glory resided. This is remarkable. This is staggering when we think about it. And yet when we pull back, we might wonder, but then why was Jesus so, so normal? Why was he in some ways in appearance and in status somewhat unremarkable? Why was he so human? Why wasn't he more of a demigod that we see in, in, in Greek mythology? Muscles, beauty, power. And I think to answer that, Paul turns to the to specific word he uses three times in seven verses here. And that word is mystery. Mystery. A mystery is a thing hidden. It's not obvious to understanding. It's something difficult or impossible to explain. We like a good mystery because we can't figure it out. A good mystery, whether in a movie or a book or a play, is full of intrigue, of twists and turns, of disguises. It has high stakes and a stunning conclusion. And so here we find that Paul is talking about the glorious mystery of God. The glorious mystery of God. And what that glorious mystery is and the, is that the absolute stunner of history is that in Jesus, God's immense glory lived as a humble servant, died as a rejected criminal, but was resurrected as Lord to redeem his broken and rebellious creation. And here's the shocking part. Did you catch it? That this mystery, that this glorious mystery that this revelation wasn't just for the Jews, but it was for all people. All people. And then there's more. In Colossians 1, 26 and 27, it says, the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations, but is now revealed to his saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, that's us, how great are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Did you catch that? The glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Christ in you, Christ in me. And so this is glory talk. If Jesus, if Christ is the manifestation of God's glory, of the kavod, of the brilliance, the, ra the radiance, the heaviness and the weight, then he is living within us we are filled with the glory of God. That changes everything. We are filled with the glory of God. And so this was the glory that made the earth shake and the mountains tremble. And it is in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this is what Paul is talking about when he refers to it as the hope of glory. The hope of glory. But if we're not careful, that phrase, the hope of glory, as great as it sounds, becomes another churchy phrase that we can use and not fully get what it means. And so this week, I've been thinking over it and over and trying to figure out what is he exactly saying when he says the hope of glory. I know it's important, but what does it actually mean? And as I thought about it, I really came to understand it when I defined it by what it's not, by defining by negation. And so what I mean by that is I defined it as, like, its opposite, the hopelessness of glorilessness. And what I mean by that is hopelessness, despair. I get what despair is. I've known some despair. 
And if glory is value, respect, substance, mass, and matter, I get what it's like not to have it. I've wondered, do I matter? Do my choices matter? The hopelessness of gloriousness is the despair that hits us, those moments in the dark of night where we wonder, does any of this matter? Is my life worth anything? Do I have value? Do I have respect? Am I loved? And so when I get there and then invert it, that's how I understand what the hope of glory is. And so here, let me tell you a story. Going back to the Olympics. In 2016, Matthew Sintrowitz, the American di middle distance runner, pulled a stunning and remarkable upset when he won the, 1500, the men's 1500 meter run. He became the third American to ever to do it and the first since 1908. This is a big deal. I remember watching it on TV and being excited. And the next morning, he posted on his Instagram account a picture of himself in his USA singlet wearing his gold medal. And the caption said, the two most important days of a man's life is the day he was born and the day he discovers why. Matt was glory, was for significance, for identity. And the truth of it is not to detract from his accomplishment, from the win, from the medal, from everything he had done, but that gold was not enough. You see, we are externally dependent. We, to exist, we need something outside of ourselves. And so even when we achieve moments of brilliance, we will find that they are only fleeting moments, that we need something more. Gold tarnishes. Records are broken. History is forgotten. Achievements are surpassed. Beauty fades and abilities wane. The spotlight we seek the gravity we hope to have will ultimately elude us. It will always elude us because here's the truth of it. We are not the center of the universe. The world does not revolve around us. But Jesus is. So the hope of glory is not found living for ourselves, for our own glory, but living for God and delighting in Him. The Westminster Catechism says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so when we do that, when we align ourselves with God and his glory, when we are known and we know him and we love him, we will experience his love and he will like bestow his glory upon us because we were created to be image bearers, that we will reflect his glory and it's only, that when we, only when we do that, when we reflect his glory, that we find and discover who we truly are and why we exist, why we matter. We discover purpose. And that's what God has called us to. Because in doing that, we will experience his love and grace that he so gloriously lavishes upon us. Living for the greatness and glory of God is not a diminishment of ourselves, but an enlargement and this is why Paul talks over and over and over that why he was so willing to suffer, to toil, to struggle for the gospel and for the church. It's because he's found something more significant. See, abiding in God's love and living for God's glory doesn't remove us from the dangers and the, the challenges and difficulties of being, but rather it contextualizes those dangers and difficulties and sets them up in comparison to the all-surpassing greatness and power of God. And so grief and pain may be present for a moment, but God's glory that he bestows upon us will radiate forever into eternity. 
And so what does that actually look like? I want to end with reading a quote from theologian N.T. Wright as he talks about this. He says, God alone will sum up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. The new heavens and the new earth. It would be the height of folly to think that we could assist him in that great work. But what we can and must do in the present, if we are obedient to the gospel, if we are following Jesus, and if we are indwelt, energized, and directed by the Spirit, is to build for the kingdom. This brings us back to 1 Corinthians 15, 58 once more. What you do in the Lord is not in vain. You are not oiling the wheels of a machine that's about to roll off a cliff. You are not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be thrown into a fire. You are not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up and turned into a building site. You are, strange as though it may seem, almost as hard to believe as the resurrection itself, accomplishing something that will become in due course part of God's new world. Every act of love, every act of gratitude and kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and the delight in his beauty as creator, every minute spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care and nurture, of comfort or support for one's fellow human beings, or for that matter, one's fellow non-human creatures. And of course, every prayer, all spirit-led teaching, every deed that spreads the gospel, builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in this world, all of this will find its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. That is the logic of the mission of God. God's recreation of his wonderful world, which began with the resurrection of Jesus and continues mysteriously as God's people live into the risen Christ and in the power of his spirit, means that what we do in Christ by the power of the spirit in this present moment is not wasted. It will last all the way into God's new world. In fact, it will be enhanced there. And that is our hope of glory that God is giving us. What you do today, how you live for him, and how you love others will reverberate and resound into all eternity and into God's new creation. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a great and glorious God. We thank you that we can't even begin to fathom all that you are, and that there is no end to you. We will never be disappointed or, or, come, or realize that you are not enough, but there will always be more beauty, more glory, more radiance, more love. And so, God, we ask that we would truly be your people and enter into that, and that we would live for you. Lord, give us eyes, not for ourselves, but for you and for others in our life today and tomorrow. And as we come to the table, would we come boldly, remembering your sacrifice and identifying that we are your children. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And I'll receive our morning offering and uh, ponder that great message that, that Christ is our hope and our glory and that he will hold us fast as we um, even deal with the difficulties in our life. <coughs> Oh
people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, thank you for the incredible gift of revealing the hope of your glory through Jesus Christ. Not only did you reveal your glory, you also share it with us through the Holy Spirit. Help us to shine this light in all that we say and do for your sake and for your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Renew and strengthen your church. Grant wings to its words so hearts are touched by the gospel of salvation. Make it swift to speak and show mercy in your name. Make us tireless in bearing witness to you and conform us to your will. Lord, in your mercy. O light and path through death's dark valley, be the strong guide and sure comfort of all who walk through difficulties including Robin Lee and her family, Stephanie Boyer's sister, Steve Matheson, Jane Pickering, the Finch family, Alan Weingartner, the Kilman family, Vladenberg's daughter-in-law, Jerry Anderson, Bonnie Kenny's family, the Henderson family, <laughs> 